the title of the talk today, I'm going to be talking about local and global connections in early modern Glencoe, and, and kind of expanding that out to the kind of wider, the greater Glencoe landscape as well, so the eastern Larigs, the, the old hunting forest over to Dalness, and, and also the kind of fringes of Rannachmoor as well. And this will hopefully feed on a little bit from those of you who saw my talk last year or who have maybe caught us at one or two of the other things. And most of my kind of shielding research has been in this glen here. You can see the photo of Glen Lachnamuye, but this is it from a slightly different perspective. Um, So just to give a a, a brief kind of overview, I guess, um, of this season, our our kind of field school, um, which this is kind of based around, um, runs as a kind of training excavation, training survey experience um, for the students, for for our kind of, uh, level two into level three, so into honours students. Um, now, we, we've kind of designed the, the field programme around the kind of specialism of the, the staff and the, the student body who are kind of uh, from the PhDs who are kind of interested in the Glencoe landscape and particularly kind of early modern archaeology. Um, so I've been leading up the excavation side of the project as well as aspects of the survey. Um, the, the kind of, my kind of co-director in the survey is Dr. Michael Gavin um, and then Dr. Gareth Beale, uh, Dr. Nicole Smith, and Elizabeth Robertson ca- carry on the kind of uh, creative media and engagement side of the progr- project. Um, and this involves a lot of kind of stakeholder work with our with our kind of stakeholders in Glencoe. So that's the the National Trust for Scotland, the Glencoe Folk Museum, um, but then also uh, Black Mount Estate and Black Quarries Estates as well, who have been very kind in letting us carry out carry out field work on their land. Um, and are very kind of positive about about kind of disseminating the archaeology of their estates as well. So they've been amazingly helpful um, as well. So I'm just going to go through kind of each of the aspects of the what's kind of been going on and pick out some of the more interesting stories that we've managed to kind of unravel from from these different aspects of the kind of field program uh, this summer. Um, so just to start off then with the survey, um, sorry, uh, and, and and just to kind of familiarise ourselves, I guess, with the kind of Glasgow landscape and the area that we're kind of talking about here. Um, so hopefully we're all fairly vaguely familiar at least with with Glencoe, um, at least from having kind of barreled down the main thro- road through the middle of it, if not gone uh, kind of quarrying out into the other parts of the Glen. Um, so in the very top left-hand part of the the map there, that's Glen Lachnamuye, kind of running to the south uh, from where the kind of Clagheg Clagge Gully comes out and the settlement of Achnacon. Um, so it's this kind of large upland valley. It's currently run as a sheep farm, um, but it would have been kind of one of the main transhumance landscapes, so one of the main shielding landscapes for Glencoe. Um, in the kind of early modern period into the, the kind of later post-medieval too. Um, further along through kind of Glencoe heading east from that, you've got the settlement of Achtreofton. Um, it was where the, the National Trust for Scotland carried out their excavations. And I think from 2019 to, to 2022, uh, they carried out their excavations at Achtreofton. Um, although if you happen to be passing, you'll note that they've still not backfilled their trench. Um, uh, the next kind of area that we've been looking at in our, our work is the two eastern kind of Larigs. So Larig Ilja, the, the Pass of the Hines, um, and Larig Garten. Um, and these are two kind of quite important routeways between Glencoe uh, and Dalness, which is another of those kind of MacDonald uh, uh, t- townships um, within this area. Further to the, 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 the east of that, then you kind of come on to the kind of opening to, to uh, Rannach Moor, um, which is another of these kind of really important grazing landscapes in the early modern period. But it also has this really interesting history as being kind of one of the very, very early uh, hunting estates actually in this kind of region. Um, so Black, Black Mount Estate essentially kind of goes straight from being a kind of medieval style hunting reserve um, straight in in the kind of early 1800s. It becomes uh, a modern kind of hunting estate in the sense that we would recognise them today. And so there's a really interesting kind of infrastructure of foresters' cottages and other kind of settlement sites uh, and, and kind of infrastructure of that estate landscape that's going on across there that we had a look at as well as part of this. So just to kind of focus on what we did for the kind of survey project. Um, so it was divided into three main parts. Uh, there was a walkover survey conducted of the, the two eastern Larigs, Larig Ilja and Larig Garten, um, and the kind of wider area of the Royal Forest of Buchel, um, which is this really interesting kind of landscape that's part of Glencoe. It's part of some of the most kind of iconic landscapes of Glencoe, but it seems to kind of sit aside from the main body of the Glen. The McDonald's of Glencoe don't really seem to have any particular power over it in terms of the harvesting of the timber or the activities that are going on within it necessarily. Um, it kind of sits aside and it probably is, is kind of held um, in, in various rights by the kind of feudal superiors of the McDonald's of Glencoe, at least until uh, the, the kind of 18, uh, the turn of the, the 19th century. Um, so that would have been the Stuarts of Appen formerly, and then kind of later on the, the Campbells of Argyle. Um, one of the other areas that we've been kind of looking at is, is, is Rannoch Moor, so particularly the area around Queen's House, which is one of the settlement sites uh, near King's House Hotel. Uh, Bar Cottage, which is a, a an early kind of forester's cottage that seems to be occupied until the kind of main, the, the kind of mid to, to late nineteenth uh, century, 
Um, but there's clearly evidence for early activity going on there that I'll explore. Um, and then Bath Farmstead as well, which is a new site that we've uncovered as a result of some of the survey that's gone on. Um, we also conducted an auger survey of uh, an area of the, the, the kind of floodplain of River Kubel, um, looking essentially for an area where we could get an undisturbed peak core. Um, the, one of the kind of interests of the project is trying to do some of the kind of environmental reconstruction um, of what this landscape would have looked like in that early modern period, and particularly how is the landscape changing kind of over the course of the, the kind of late medieval into the early modern and through that into the, 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 the kind of later post medieval as well, and thinking about the kind of impact of, of deforestation, um, of changing land use that we can know, whether we know about from the documentary evidence, like the kind of the, the construction of the, the, the hunting estates, but also kind of sheep farming changes later and earlier improvements, that sort of thing, um, and the impact of the Little Ice Age as well, which obviously would have been quite drastic in, in a landscape quite as high as this. Um, you're obviously at quite a, a, a kind of high base level once you're up on Ranaquir. Uh, unfortunately, there has been quite a there's been quite a lot of uh, kind of peat uh, pot and pollen core work done on uh, Ranaquir, um, but they were very much focused on prehistory, um, and so they actually binned the later part, portions of their cores, which was quite a quite an upsetting uh, anecdote to hear. Um, and so trying to find a kind of undisturbed core for that last thousand years of history proves quite challenging anywhere where you've had peat cutting. Um, but that's the three main kind of activities that were going on as part of the survey. So just to, to kind of bring up that map again, and I'll focus first on Laragilja and Laraggarten. So one of the most interesting kind of features that we had coming out of, of, of Eastern Larags is in Laragilja, which is the Pass of the Hinds, and we have this coffin road, and it's attested from the, the documentary evidence. It also appears in, uh, in kind of described in the uh, statistical accounts as well. Um, and it links the, the settlement of Dalness uh, to the kind of main body of Glencoe and the MacDonald burial grounds on Ila Monday, um, but also on... Uh, at the kind of Episcopal Chapel at Ballyhulish as well, the Episcopalian Chapel there. Um, and so coffin roads are quite an interesting kind of phenomenon. We see them both in the, across the kind of highlands of Scotland and the Isles. Um, you see them quite commonly in Ireland and in Cumbria too. Um, so the, the exact kind of origins of these are, are, are slightly shrouded in mystery. And you see them kind of popping up occasionally in, in some of the kind of antiquarian sources. There's, there's some kind of theorizing about what, what their origin might be. Um, but essentially, they kind of they, they they come as part of a kind of belief that the the kind of touching of the de a dead body to the ground will impart some sort of taint upon that ground. That it'll be kind of uh, tainted by the kind of laying of a of a body or a body in a coffin upon it. Um, and so, as part of these kind of routes that that are kind of connecting par wider kind of disparate parishes, we have these coffin cairns, um, which appear at various kind of high points in those routes. And these are essentially places where you could then lay the coffin upon the ground without it having that kind of polluting impact upon that kind of landscape. There's quite an interesting kind of system of these up in this, this area of Glen Laragilja. But these seem to have been kind of something that's been produced over a long period of time. So some of them are quite substantial in scale. Now, if we're thinking of kind of a party carrying up a coffin on, an, on a fairly kind of infrequent basis, then this suggests that these are in use for quite a long lifespan. Um, now, unfortunately, some of them have had some, some disturbance by modern climbers' cairns, um, which does kind of confuse the picture slightly, but there's some really, really substantial cairn bases that I'll show you in a moment, that, that clearly, I think, suggest that these are, these are far older monuments than the, the kind of modern climbers' cairns. Um, so you can see two of them here. You can see that the, the, there's a group of students there uh, surveying the slightly more prominent of the two. It has this kind of modern stacked climbers' cairn on top of it. To the left of that, you can see on the kind of... Uh, lower part of the hill, there's also a kind of ring of cairn base as well, um, defined by these kind of big boulders. Um, now, these were kind of clearly um, quite quite an important part of this kind of movement between these two parts of the parish. If, if you think of this as quite a kind of ritual act, this kind of procession through the, the landscape, um, you've come up from, from down S over this quite steep ascent. Um, interestingly, it doesn't sit at the kind of actual watershed, um, neither does it sit at the very kind of peak of the pass, but where it sits is on this kind of terrace just before you kind of drop back down into Glencoe, so just as Larig uh, Ilja opens up. Um, and so you have this really kind of nice view shed right down into uh, Glencoe uh, proper. So it's, it, it's clearly the kind of part at which you would realise you were kind of on the homeward stretch, you're on the downhill uh, part of this route. Um, but the, it's, it's recorded as a set of coffin cairns in the, the um, Ordnance Survey name books as well from the mid-19th mid century. Um, and so we're looking, there's quite a long kind of trajectory of the use of these probably, considering that they'll have at least an early, uh, an early modern, if not earlier, uh, origin. Um, there has been quite a fair amount of, of work done in this. So there's an article from Scottish Studies that kind of looked at some examples, particularly from kind of further west out towards Moidart. 
Um, but there are some kind of ethnographic accounts as well. Hugh Cheeps looked at it within uh, his 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 recent work on uh, travels in Scotland as as part of that kind of big volume that came out recently. Um, and they're, they're they're quite an interesting phenomenon in this right uh, or in this kind of context as well. So thinking about kind of how these might have been used, how they how they're being kind of constructed as as a kind of act in which people are each time they you know this is this kind of ritual is being done someone's adding an extra stone to these, and so they're being accumulated over periods of time. Now, if we're thinking that these and the photographs are fairly modern examples, these are still kind of in use, um, and that clearly these things only maybe have a couple of uses before they, another one is constructed by the look of these kind of clusters, um, then the ones that we have in Glencoe seem to, to suggest quite a long kind of duration of use. They're far more substantial than any of these um, as well. So you can see there another couple of shots of that kind of main uh, Cairn base there. So there's some really substantial boulders have been levered into place to create that kind of more permanent uh, ring cairn around the edge there. Um, so something quite interesting is going on here. Um, this is also obviously part of that, that kind of hunting forest, the royal hunting forest, the Buckle. Um, so there's, there's a quite interesting kind of question about what else is going on within this landscape, I guess. And if you think about it, it's quite a nice uh, glen, actually, as, 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 kind of, uh, as the glens of, uh, or side glens of uh, Glencoe look. Um, it's quite green, it's quite open, it has this nice kind of basinish area at the top. Um, and yet there does seem to be rather a kind of absence of shielings, an absence of, of charcoal burning platforms or, or, or the other kind of practices that you expect to see within a kind of upland transhumance landscape. So there is perhaps this suggestion that something other than what would be going on um, and, and, and those sorts of areas is going on here. And that's perhaps part of this being kind of preserved as a kind of hunting forest. There's, there's controls on what can and can't be done here, and they survive potentially quite late into this period. Um, so it's, it's certainly a really interesting landscape that we hope to do a bit more work in um, in, in the kind of coming uh, years. You can see there again that that kind of shot um, with the, the the cairn bases there um, and there and and this is on a, a really kind of prominent position. So just just to kind of bear that in mind, it's it's a really interesting kind of set of features. Thinking about how this landscape is being used and the kind of connections between two two kind of disparate parts of the same parish. Moving out onto Rannoch Moor then, um, so. We, we have this quite interesting kind of trajectory of, of, of use of the landscape. Black Mount Estate um, appears to have kind of been a, a hunting forest since probably the, the kind of 15th or 16th century. So fairly early, if we think about it, and you're really back in the kind of tradition of the medieval hunt then. So thinking about kind of mass parties going out for days, um, the kind of chief for the lairds um, and their, their, their horses um, and, and their kind of retinue, hunting hounds, etc., driving game often into kind of deer traps, this sort of thing. Um, so it's a very different kind of style of hunting from what would be seen in the kind of modern landscape um, that we expect, or the kind of nineteenth century hunting, the, the the kind of guns, games, and and the grandee, um, that kind of solitary or or kind of group uh, hunt that's very much about kind of the the hunter and their prey um, as as a kind of challenge, I guess. Um, so it's it's quite a different kind of style of what's going on in that early period. But we also have this really interesting nineteenth century estate landscape too going on. And so this is Bar Cottage in the image here. Um, but there's a whole kind of host of activity going on across this landscape, and just the very name of of the river that's running by it, of the site itself, Ba, cows, um, and, and and Gaelic. So we've clearly got kind of a landscape that's that's it's already quite strongly associated with with cattle, with livestock. This is clearly one of the kind of major transhumance landscapes for for um, this kind of part of both the the kind of north or the the northwestern part of the southwest island. Um, but also areas of pasture and such as well that connect into this landscape. It's a really important kind of connection point between all these different um, kind of areas, Badnock as well, uh, all kind of running through to these kind of drove roads that are connecting this place. Um, so it's a really interesting kind of landscape to think about. Today it looks so desolate and empty, but in actual fact we have what's quite a busy landscape going on here. So to look a little bit at the, the archaeology of Bar Cottage and the archival records that we have for it, um, so the earliest record that we actually have for the site is 1863. Um, it was furnished with uh, it was provided with furnishings at the cost of one in five. Um, later on, it seems to have been damaged by some subtenants, um, and then there's also this kind of quote that notes that it's being used essentially as as a kind of refreshment stop stop for deer stalkers, um, but potentially also kind of occupied infrequently by foresters working on that estate, um, who are who are kind of policing that that kind of making sure there's no poaching activity going on kind of maintaining deer numbers, perhaps doing some aspects of kind of maintaining the, the, the woodlands around there. Though we know that by this point, the, the forest of Blackmount, which is part of the Glen Orkey and the Bredalban Estates, has almost been entirely cleared by this point. Um, so it's quite a different landscape than what would have existed 100 years prior. Um, now, what's quite interesting about the site is it, its kind of form, I guess. Um, thinking about your kind of classic uh, sort of 
hunting hunting lodge, hunting uh, camp, uh, keepers or forest uh, foresters kind of cottage. Um, the structure itself is perhaps quite unsurprising. It's it's clearly kind of improvement structure, lime mortared kind of straight corners and such. But there are some kind of interesting elements to the structure as well. It's clearly been extended at some point, so there is an earlier core to it. Um, and that earlier core seems to have been built almost in, in, in quite an unimproved fashion. Um, if we think about the, the kind of general design of it, it seems to be kind of rounded river river pebbles that have had the ends chopped, uh, knocked off them to create a kind of straight edge. Um, but certainly a very different kind of style to this really nice kind of mortared edge that we're seeing in that front uh, left corner of the structure in the photo there. Um, so there is some quite interesting kind of phasing that we're looking to unpick at the structure. There's also some suggestions of kind of rig and furrow surrounding it as well, which isn't necessarily typical of what you'd expect of kind of the foresters' cottages. Um, particularly one that's not really being occupied very frequently. Um, not impossible, but certainly uh, of interest there. Um, and also the kind of form of the enclosure itself is quite curious. So it sits within this quite kind of looping enclosure that's built up against the Alcragan Namin, um, which is the, the burn of the rock uh, of the kids, so the kid goats. Um, so the place has this, or the, at least the kind of area has this association with, with goats, um, which seems to have been one of the main kind of uh, pastoral animals that are being grazed on Ranach Moor as well. So we've got the, the cattle obviously perhaps are being given the kind of primer ground, but up on these kind of rockier hill slopes, goats goats are perhaps kind of dominating and there's a few more scattered goat place names in this area as well. Um, but there's certainly there's sort of suggestions that there might be an earlier sort of focus of activity going on here and certainly there's quite an extensive network of peat cutting going on in the surrounding area, which again kind of begs some interesting questions about what's going on here. One of the other sites um, very, very close to the back cottage is this site here. So it was initially uh, surveyed by myself on the aerial photographs. We then went out on a series of site visits and we've worked out that, in fact, rather than the shielding that I kind of thought slash perhaps hoped it was, it's actually a, an early kind of township site, farmstead site, presumably kind of pre-improvement, which is quite interesting. So we're pushing back from that, that kind of forester's phase of site and we have this farmstead. And so it sits in this bend in the River Bar where the the kind of otherwise peaty bog, uh, bog and kind of moraine is significantly better drained as a result of being by the river channel. There's quite an extensive area of cultivation. Um, and then there's also a kale yard, what might be a stock enclosure, and a kind of barn as well associated with the structures. So we've got an area of, of, of rig and furrow. Um, this is a fairly conservative survey of it. Um, on, our more, on our more recent uh, survey, we reckon that this entire area essentially is covered by a kind of loose system of rig and furrow. Um, but then we also have the house structure here, which seems to be a two-space structure. Um, we have an open classic kind of kale yard and a kind of barn structure as well. So this is clearly a, a settlement site, whether it's being occupied um, permanently or it's it's sort of one of these slightly kind of extended shieldings that gets occupied uh, as, as a kind of place of cultivation only when the ground has been sufficiently fertilised. That's something that I'd like to kind of investigate with excavation. But this is one of the really interesting sites that we have picked up. And it starts to build up this picture that actually that kind of vast expanse of Ranach Moor that looks so empty, so wild, um, is actually a place that is being occupied, at least in the, the kind of early modern period, and perhaps as a kind of response to the Little Ice Age, where you know food pressure in the in the kind of valleys um, is, is 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 kind of mounting, the population is increasing, and so there's a, this kind of push to have to um, provide more more ground under cultivation. So that's one interpretation, at least, of this. Um, another site we have here is Queen's House. Um, so this is a, another quite interesting site. It sits just on the other side of the river from King's House and slightly to the west on the military road is the road that you can see running there. Um, and it has this quite interesting kind of system of, of, of enclosures, which seem to have a, a variety of kind of different phases going on. Um, it has then two structures which sit in a kind of L shape. Um, the structure number two, I would hazard, is a kind of barn, um, and it seems to have a kind of uh, slope in it for drainage, which which seems quite quite classic to me to be a, a kind of barn with a, a kind of grain store or something associated with it. There's an interesting stance to the north of it, um, which is this kind of circular feature here. And then there's the main structure there with what might be a kind of tatty shed or, or, or kind of tool store um, at one end of that as well. And it's quite an interesting site because it's, it's actually within an area that is marked as the uh, shillings of Carnach and uh, Inverigan. Um, so it's within this area that theoretically ought to be a kind of shielding ground, but we clearly have a, an area of cultivation, we have a system of enclosures, um, and then we have these two um, sort of farmstead-style structures as well. Um, and this appears very, in the very first instance, um, in, uh, pardon me, um, it appears in uh, a map from the probably the early 19th century, which says site of proposed new inn, um, which is quite interesting. So potentially this lying on the ground of the McDonald's of Glencoe rather than King's House, which land, lies on the, the land of the uh, Campbells of Bredalbin, 
and is there kind of attempt at maybe stealing some of the business of of uh, King's House Hotel, which is quite an interesting kind of uh, thought process for thinking about why this is kind of being developed on this site because it's not necessarily an ideal area. It's in within this quite quite horribly boggy area actually. Um, so clearly quite a lot of the quite intensive work has had to go on to create this nicely drained kind of area for cultivation. Um, and the question is, why is it here? Um, and that kind of facing right onto the military road, to my mind, suggests that, yeah, this has probably been developed as a kind of early change house, um, perhaps in direct competition with the King's House Hotel. Moving on to kind of one of the other strands of what we've been doing. Um, so this is, we also had a kind of group working with creative media and engagement. So this was both looking at kind of recording the different practices we were doing as field workers in the landscape. Um, so we had uh, Elizabeth Robertson uh, leading uh, audio recordings of kind of some of the sites that we're working in, some of the landscapes we're working in, some of the kind of natural, but also the kind of activities that we were doing as well and the discussions that we were having on site to try and kind of create a, a, almost a kind of oral history and, and a kind of record of the, the act of excavation as it was going on, as the act of survey as it was going on as well within these landscapes um, and our kind of experiences of that place. Um, and then Gareth Beale kind of led the students um, in that, that initial week in, in producing kind of pieces of creative film, both around our kind of study sites again, but also around some of the other kind of stories that are going on within the Glenscoe landscape. Um, and these were put together um, and composed into an audiovisual installation, which was, was installed in the uh, Glencoe Turf House during our open day um, at the site. Um, and the second week, the students then worked with Nicole Smith and uh, Elizabeth Robertson to produce a series of kind of creative media outputs for the Glencoe Folk Museum. So this was a really nice opportunity for the students to work uh, with kind of industry partners, so the National Trust of Scotland and, and the Glencoe Folk Museum, who are also our kind of key research stakeholders in this work. Um, and, and one of the, the outputs that they made was a nice kind of uh, stop motion animation uh, that told the story of the, the creation of the Glencoe Folk Museum, essentially, because it's quite a nice story in its own right. Barbara Fairweather and a group of local women kind of coming together, collecting aspects of the kind of folk life of their area um, that they saw as kind of being threatened um, by the kind of uh, modernization, I guess, that was going on within the landscape at that time and changes to people's lives and kind of local pra uh, kind of agricultural practices and such. Um, but also uh, kind of this, this kind of perception that that aspect of the heritage of Glencoe wasn't particularly valued and so that an effort was kind of consciously made to 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 um, preserve that. Um, and so we've been working quite closely with them. This involved also kind of production of audio installations as well within the house, um, but also a series of kind of creative zines, so little kind of magazines um, that were produced as well, which follows into a, a, a kind of style of media that the Glencoe Folk Museum has have been producing since the very beginning in the form of kind of small pamphlets about local interests and kind of stories. So a series of those were also produced by the students as well. And we also hosted an open day, so you can see on the, the right hand side there's the interior of the, the NTS Reconstruction Turf House, where we put on this audio visual installation which had both aspects of Gaelic storytelling and song, but also footage from our site, footage from our excavations, footage from the landscapes we're working in. So trying to kind of bring people, because unfortunately the sites we're working in were often quite isolated, quite remote, and quite kind of logistically challenging to get people to. It was our kind of way of trying to bring those sites to people. And we also ran a kind of artifact handling session, bit of a spoiler perhaps for you guys later on, with kind of members of the public that arrived. This was run halfway through our excavations, so that the assemblage wasn't quite as it is now. But it was a really nice opportunity for people to be able to get hands on with this kind of material evidence of their area's past. We had some activities for children, mini excavations, clay pot making, um, and, and kind of pottery conservation as well. And then in the end, we had over 600 visitors, which was really, really nice. So it ended up being a really kind of fruitful engagement event. So now on to the excavation. This is the part that I'm slightly more familiar with, I must say, as, as, as this is where I spent my entire time and would have been kind of working on. So we were investigating the site of the summer house of McKeon. Um, so it's quite an interesting uh, site. This has kind of been preserved in the, the oral history records and the kind of folk records and in the kind of antiquarian literature from the kind of late 18th and early 19th century that this was the summer house of McKeon. Now, now what, what is a, a chief summer house? What does that mean? Um, that, that, that's something that, that we were kind of hoping to unpick through this. And was this house, in fact, a kind of chiefly residence? And, and, and what is a chiefly re residence in the uplands? Um, in this sense. So it's, it's quite a, a kind of curious site, quite quite an interesting site in its own right. Um, and really, I would say probably among the kind of first of its kind to have received archaeological excavation um, in terms of thinking of a, a kind of elite residence of this scale in the uplands, thinking that to kind of contextualise the McDonald's of Glencoe aren't very big players right? um, in, their own, in, in this kind of regional game. They're not particularly powerful lords. They don't have a tower house. They don't have castles. They don't have particularly grand halls. Um, the, the, the kind of average average dwelling is their 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 kind of chiefly dwellings probably aren't that different to to that that their taxmen are living in and such. 
Um, so what is this quite substantial building up in the uplands? And you can see it's part of this kind of wider system of enclosures. Now, the system of enclosures, we didn't get the chance, unfortunately, to, to investigate where these related to the later sheep farm, which is just downhill of here, or are they related to this structure? Um, but the, this idea of the, the kind of summer house of McKean actually has quite a, a kind of early uh, history to it. Um, so the site is, is, is mentioned um, in a poem that doesn't specifically reference it, but does reference McKean going to his summer house um, in a poem written in the, in the uh, 1740s, um, which recounts the events of the Glencoe Massacre. So we have quite an early point at which this, this, there is this kind of notion that MacDonald chiefs are going to a summer residence for their, for their summer um, and are kind of entertaining there. There's talk of kind of the pipers and feasting um, and hunts that are going on from, this site, from a site, presumably this one. Um, so just to, to kind of go into the excavation then, um, it's quite an interesting, quite a complicated structure actually. Um, this was uh, in the summer or in the, the, the kind of spring before it was excavated. Um, so it's quite a substantial stone structure. Um, it seemed to have already from the, the kind of offset, one end was particularly boggy, the other side slightly better draining, but it sits within this kind of system of enclosures and, and kind of adjacent to that modern farm building uh, down at the bottom there, which is probably uh, constructed around about the, uh, sorry, the 1820s, 1830s. Um, and it's part of the kind of McDonald establishment of a network of sheep farms in the upper parts of the Glen, which really is the kind of introduction of the clearances to this landscape as well. So there's quite an interesting uh, shift that goes on from this being a kind of busy seasonal transhumance landscape to a sheep farm, um, and the perhaps kind of change in the seasonal rhythms that are going on um, in that kind of later period. But far earlier, we have this structure here, and it seems to, to have its own kind of lifespan and, 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 and abandonment phase um, independent of that. So this is the, the, the kind of main end of the structure, I guess. The kind of entertaining space, um, but as you can see, just from its kind of construction, it's quite a quite a substantial structure. It has quite thick uh, boulder and rubble cored walls. Um, it has this really really impressive fireplace built up against the the gable end, and just kind of bear that in mind because that's quite an unusual feature for structures of this kind of uh, for this region um, and, and and for this era as well. So there's something quite interesting going on with this structure. Um, so just to kind of contextualise it again, hopefully for those of you who were uh, listening in at my, at my talk last uh, winter. Um, this is the kind of transhumance, the kind of shielding landscape that I've been looking at from a previous set of excavations. So you can see there some of the, ex the structures that we excavated for those, uh, the stance, the small shielding, uh, a turf, the kind of larger turf shielding, and that kind of whiskey bothy with the kind of earlier collective or, or kind of larger shielding as well. I mean, there's a small patch of rug and furrow associated with them, but it sits within this kind of quite busy cluster of peat stances, shielding huts, uh, perhaps stack stances, cultivation areas, and, and dwellings as well. Um, but we're within this kind of busy uh, transhumance landscape and steering right across there then is this area that's associated with the chief of McDonald's. So what is the chief doing amongst the milkmaids? Um, and you can see there again, so that the structure is just up here um, and the, the, the shielings are kind of arrayed on these slopes here. So again, they're within hearing range of each other, they're within sight range of each other. There's a quite clear connection between this kind of transhumance landscape and the, the summer house of McKean as well. This is a, a plan drawing of the site. So we have, it was excavated in, in, in slots. Um, so we have up here what appears to be the workspace, perhaps a kitchen, and um, perhaps the buyer. It's quite unclear, but it has this kind of gravelly floor with quite a lot of organic material through it, particularly a lot of charcoal. Um, so, so clearly some activities going on here, um, perhaps that's intended to kind of drain better, although it is horrifically boggy in that end of the structure to the extent that the students uh, used, to, used to kind of say they would dig until they smelled eggs. Uh, as the way to know you hit a new floor layer. Um, but what was quite interesting out of there, though, was from our flotation of the, the soil samples, we had quite a lot of leather offcuts. So clearly there's craft activity going on there. There's the processing of hides is going on, perhaps tanning is going on as well, within this kind of craft space at the one end of the structure. Um, now, the rest of the structure has this really, really grand slab floor. Um, this is really, really substantial slabs of schist that are clearly being levered up from the valley bottom, from the river itself. Um, and they're really nicely kind of worn smooth on the upper surfaces. Um, and some of them have even been kind of worked in certain ways to make them kind of fit nicer, particularly around the kind of fireplace there. Um, but these are kind of being brought up, and this makes it a really kind of an ostentatious structure. I mean, the sheer amount of effort that's gone into producing this floor, um, some of these slabs are, are over a metre in, 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 in size uh, across. So they're really, really kind of heavy work that's gone on to produce this. Um, there's quite a lot of kind of spoliation uh, or robbery that's gone on in the middle of the structure here. Um, you can see this kind of big muddy pit. Um, so we think that's related to the kind of later sheep farm. Um, but just kind of going through the areas of the structure then, so this is that kind of end of the, the structure there. Um, it's defined by essentially this massive wad of kind of sphagnum moss and forming peat on top of it. 
Uh, coming down then onto this kind of gravelly floor surface, which is interspersed with quite a lot of broken up pottery for one, um, but also uh, kind of deposits of charcoal, pieces of kind of burnt uh, birch wood, uh, or, or kind of, uh, but also is kind of organic preserved wood as well, um, and, and lots and lots of charcoal, as I said. Um, so there's something quite interesting going on here. We clearly have a kind of more utility utilitarian space it's a kind of working space perhaps whether that be the kind of classic buyer although we didn't come across any evidence for a drain um or else it's a a, a kind of craft activity space kitchen perhaps um is unclear we didn't unfortunately find a hearth within this structure though due to the kind of nature of the, the deposits we decided it was best just to half section it and then to sondage it um so as not to kind of disturb the the, the preserved organic material which we didn't really have the budget for the conservation for um, into the kind of other end of the structure, the very far end of the structure, we have this kind of strange rectangular add-on to the, the, the end of the structure at that kind of gable wall with a fireplace. And then within it, we have a series of quite confusing floor layers. Now, I'm still trying to kind of wrap my head around exactly what's going on here. But we have an area that has a kind of turf floor, which is, uh, or a kind of earthen floor, which is right on the kind of immediate interior, which then has this very nice worked slab against it, this being the kind of wall facing to the west, I guess. Um, on the exterior, we had quite a nice kind of midden deposit there, and there's a drain that runs through and under the wall. So clearly, this is a space that's expected to require drainage. Now, on the interior, then, um, in the other kind of opposite corner of this, because it was excavated in two quarters, um, we had this area of kind of cobbled floor surface adjacent to and appearing, appearing to abut a slab surface as well, again, out of these kind of big slabs of schist. So a kind of raised platform within the structure, this kind of slab floor, which slopes gently towards the entranceway, and then a kind of earth floored area with a drain running through it so to my mind that implies that this is a space probably used for livestock i mean our thoughts was this was maybe like a small stables and um, thinking in the the idea that this is kind of an elite dwelling so it's, it's potentially not necessarily operating as a kind of full fully kind of year-round occupied barn uh, buyer kind of house but in fact maybe something different's going on here um, and that was that was slightly kind of confirmed when we had two crotal bells came out of it so that's kind of sleigh bells horse drawn vehicle bells were found within that structure. So that was quite interesting in one aspect. We also got a buyer grate uh, preserved with the wooden handle, which was really nice. So a kind of early pitchfork that's presumably for the moving of manure, um, but also perhaps the kind of carting of fodder into feed horses. So our, our kind of initial assumption that this is probably a, a kind of small stable structure um, or, or potentially a buyer. Um, and we're hoping to do some, some analysis of the, the, the uh, preserved soil samples from that and uh, that we didn't float to see if we can get any uh, dung material coming out of it and supposedly you can uh, get certain biomarkers that might tell you whether it's cattle or or, or horses or, or whatever that might have been kept in there but it's certainly one of the one of the many areas of this structure where just questions abound as to quite what's going on within it uh, moving on to the kind of main space of the structure then so just to give you a kind of sense of the the, the sheer scale of, of this kind of slab floor it's a really really impressive space um, and, and, and what's going on within it as well is quite complicated. So we have, we seem to have kind of different areas of activity going on within there. Again, we have evidence of kind of quite high status, potentially craft activity again. So potentially we've got glass bead making. We've certainly got glass slag. We have two glass beads from the structure as well. Um, again, there's there's some scraps of, which might suggest kind of leather working. And um, we also have evidence for gaming as well in the form of uh, both two pieces of uh, slate, uh, sort of slate slabs with a gaming board scratched onto it. Um, but then we also have a series of both ceramic and uh, one lead potentially counters um, that might have been used for playing games kind of akin to checkers. I mean, we see this at quite a lot of uh, sites of this kind of period and earlier um, across the Highlands and Islands. So thinking about the kind of recent excavation or the recently published excavations of Elon Donnan, um, but right the way back as well to Finn Lagan, um, this, kind of, this kind of counter gaming boards um, often on kind of slates um, are quite classic uh, uh, for kind of high status sites um, related to kind of lords and chiefs um, within this region. So so we have some of, at least some of the kind of material culture that we would expect of quite a high status dwelling is already coming out of this. Um, and, and again, just to kind of focus on that fireplace at the far end of the structure, because that's perhaps to my mind, the most one of the most convincing aspects beyond the material culture um, that, that really points to this being something different from your average kind of upland dwelling. Um, your, the kind of central hearth would be classic I think in a, in a kind of structure of this era and certainly in, in most of the kind of excavations that have gone on of kind of early modern to, to, to post medieval structures it's the kind of central heart that's it's very much in the tradition all the way back to the longhouse and the kind of pictish style quick, quick, quick karmic houses all the way through to pretty much uh, the, the kind of black house and, and, and the early kind of crofters house is that kind of central heart going on and um, but the fact that we have this really really grand fireplace up against the gable wall to my mind suggests that there's almost a kind of borrowing of architecture that you expect of a far higher status dwelling 
um, within what is what isn't that fantastically huge a structure, but certainly has these quite kind of monumental aspects to it. Um, it has the fireplace has these kind of mantel pieces. I would say I, I would say um, constructed out of these slabs that have been levered upwards um, and then kind of wedged in place with a kind of rubble core behind them. Um, and then the uh, the floor has actually been kind of worked so that it pr produces a really nice kind of uh, frontage against that with some of the nicer kind of worked slabs. So this is clearly quite a kind of well constructed and, and quite kind of uh, imposing piece of architecture in its own right, thinking about kind of what the average dwelling in Glencoe probably looked at this point. And to my mind, this is really yeah, borrowing kind of the architecture of, of, of the Stuart Rappin's kind of tower houses, which the McDonald's of Glencoe chiefs would have been visiting presumably fairly frequently. Um, which are only just round the coast at uh, uh, Castle Stalker, and then there's the kind of later mansion house as well. And but also kind of Campbell of Bradalba and such, you know, the McDonald's of Glencoe are kind of players in the wider kind of regional politics at this point in time. Um, and so it's quite it's quite understandable that they would kind of have, have access to the architecture, if not the resources to reproduce it, um, of of their kind of resource be better resource uh, kind of neighbours. And um, kind of moving moving on then from that, um, just to kind of compare the floor, this is the floor of the Actreuthan house that was excavated. Now it probably dates from the mid uh, mid to late 18th century, but it's far less substantial as much as it's also made out of slabs of chest. It's a very different kind of style of dwelling in the interior there. This is also a kind of a more kind of permanently occupied site, but but you can see clearly there that this is a it's a very different scale of activity that's gone on in the production of this far more vernacular floor, I would say, than the really kind of high status, very impressive uh, floor in our dwelling. Um, which is a, a clearly earlier structure too. Looking at some of the kind of material we're getting from the site as well, this is where we again get this kind of picture that something quite different is going on here. So we have this, we have quite a quite a vast array of, of clay pipes. This is only a, a small kind of fraction of the clay pipes we have from the site. But what's quite interesting is some of those are really, really early in style. Um, so particularly the bottom two uh, on the right hand side of the pipes and that kind of slightly artful array there, um, they are probably of a style that's kind of 1610, uh, 1620s. Um, so this is really, really early for the arrival of tobacco, even in Scotland more generally, some might say. Um, so you're thinking at a point in which uh, King James is writing his, his treaties against tobacco smoking. Um, it's, it's kind of first arriving and, and, and being disapproved of by the king. But even at that point, it seems the McDonald's of Glencoe have access to, to tobacco. So they have connections to kind of the Americas uh, and to this kind of wider system of, 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 of kind of colonial activity that's going on, even though at this very, very early stage in that. But there's a kind of whole host of, of clay pipes from, from quite secure context that, that go right the way from that kind of 1610s, 1620s, right the way through to the uh, 1680s, 1690s. So clearly there's, there's fairly kind of high status activity going on at this site, even just by the merit of, of, of the kind of access to tobacco as a quite elite uh, resource at this point. And thinking about the kind of size of those tobacco pipe bowls, um, it's a really kind of tiny pinch you're using for these. Um, we also have quite a nice array of uh, munitions. So we have quite a lot of shot. Um, a mixture of, of fouling shot, we think, so very, very small lead pellets. Um, and then also this kind of far larger shot, which we think is probably from a kind of early arquebus. Um, so not pre-musket sort of pre shot, essentially, which is quite interesting in its own right. We potentially have this kind of small lead cap, cap as well, which might be the kind of cap of a powder horn. Um, and we also have this nice uh, gun flint as well. Um, this is just the unfired shot. We have another uh, set of six, I think, pieces of, of fired shot as well that were recovered from a midden. So this, to my mind, suggests that we've got kind of hunting activity going on at the site. And the other really interesting kind of aspect of the assemblage that we has, have um, is the ceramics. So according to Derek Hall, who's had a look at our pottery initially and is going to be uh, doing the main study of it, and we have what might be one of the richest rural assemblages of uh, European ceramics uh, and imported ceramics in Scotland. So that's a, a really quite an interesting kind of fact. And, and obviously, there's, there's certain elements to which, you know, in, in, in kind of castle sites and such, where the, you've got continued occupation, you're losing a lot of that kind of earlier material, the kind of early modern material, through successive reiterations of the kind of architecture of the site. Um, but certainly, we have a really, really impressive assemblage, both of kind of Scottish redwares, um, but in the form of kind of quite grand serving plates, quite, quite richly decorated ones. And hopefully, those of you who are coming, uh, coming to see our artifacts in a couple of weeks' time will get to see this. Um, but we've also got sort of English Staffordshire wares. Um, we've got Bartman jugs, so the quite kind of classic bearded face jugs, which are, are produced kind of and generally associated with kind of trade with the Hanseatic League. And um, so coming all the way from the kind of Rhine and the Western uh, the Western world, and um, we've got Western world tankards as well, which are quite high status, um, often seen as kind of diplomatic gifts almost, um, kind of beautiful grey and blue uh, tankard pieces as well. Um, we have quite 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 a kind of vast array actually of these different imported European ceramics. 
So it does kind of beg the question, A, why are we finding these at what's presumably not even a kind of permanently occupied site, but it's only kind of a summer dwelling? Um, and, 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 and B, kind of, to what extent does that kind of talk about the status of this dwelling, what's going on at this site? Um, if, if the McDonald's of Glencore are clearly kind of putting their flashiest dining wear out uh, on the dinner table up in this kind of upland summer house, um, and so our current kind of interpretation for this site is that it's kind of a, it's essentially a kind of feasting hall, uh, a, a hunting lodge um, of that kind of earlier style thinking about kind of the McDonald chiefs bringing together potentially their kind of tenants, their vassals, uh, their, 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 their um, dependents, um, and but also their kind of neighbours as well, and trying to kind of showcase their status, their power, their, their chiefly characteristics, their generosity through these kind of displays that are going on as part of kind of seasonal hunting activity. Um, and it's part of this kind of, this quite well attested to kind of tradition of chiefs having to kind of show their chiefliness um, because their position isn't necessarily quite as fixed as they like to think. Um, and that the kind of hereditary bond of, of kind of chief being the, the chief's son isn't necessarily quite as strong as, as it might be led to believe. I mean, we can see that right the way into the, 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 the 1740s, 1750s. Um, and so the, the chief of the, the Stuarts of Appen, a far more powerful clan just to the west of here, um, but their chief doesn't actually get made the leader of their regiment in the 1745 Rising. And when he's kind of making his case for why that might be the why why he, he wasn't kind of the leader of his own clan during the Rising, when he's trying to kind of get off the hook for his potential Jacobitism, um, he, he notes that, that he was seen as being kind of unclannish. Um, and so there was the possibility by which kind of a, a chief could kind of lose their status, could, could lose some of their kind of powers if they weren't seen to be kind of entertaining um, and, and doing things that a chief ought to do, you know, gaming and, and showing off their wit entertaining and showing off their generosity kind of feast, feasts and hunts um, but also kind of the, the, the kind of martial capabilities as well through some of these kind of hunts as a kind of proxy for war essentially when you're not actually going out in cattle raiding um, you're kind of gathering together still the, the, the men that you can bring together into your kind of miniature war host and you're taking them out into the uplands on kind of grand displays of, of kind of pursuit um, and, and kind of campaigns against the deer almost so there's this kind of perhaps notion that actually um, this is these sorts of sites are quite important places actually for how kind of chiefs are projecting their power, how they're kind of producing their, their power within this kind of system. Um, and that's just to kind of showcase some of those finds there. So we have these really, really beautiful pieces of European imported ceramics on the right hand side there. Um, the Bartman jug, kind of quite substantial vessels, probably for importing wine or beer, um, but also far finer vessels as well. So the two kind of in the middle there, which are fragments, one's perhaps kind of Raren or Delftware, um, and the other one's clearly kind of Western world. Um, but that, these are these are kind of from serving serving jugs, perhaps, but also tankards and kind of personal uh, uh, vessels as well. That are really about kind of projecting the power, the wealth, the status of the McDonald chiefs to whoever it is that they're bringing up to this site. But it's clearly for display. These aren't your average, average and everyday pieces pieces of kind of tableware. Um, and even our kind of Scottish redwares um, are are kind of evidence of big plates of platters, which again isn't necessarily the kind of classic thing that you're consuming off of. These are clearly kind of for display as well. And these are just some examples of what those pieces might have looked like. So thinking about kind of these are quite flashy pieces of gear. I mean, particularly the, the kind of Staffordshire slipwares um, and also the, the, the kind of Westerwald, which the tankard in the centre there kind of represent. These are, these are very much in a European context this time, deemed as being kind of things that are being handed out at, at weddings, at christenings. But this is between kind of high status families. These are things that you actually order potentially out of a catalogue. You know, travelling merchants are bringing around a, a catalogue of these are all the different styles that we produce um, and we can slap your your kind of face onto it if you would so desire to um, and, and these are kind of being exchanged as part of kind of systems of, of, of high status kind of gift giving that are going on so clearly something quite quite interesting is going on here with that material culture I um, mean this is just to give a sense perhaps of what the structure might have looked like a kind of a quick reconstruction drawings but we're looking certainly at quite an imposing space quite an imposing structure that's clearly kind of being designed to impress um, and on to then perhaps one of the most exciting finds we had from the structure. So the Glencoe hoard, as the, as the media very kindly dubbed it. So this is a, a hoard of 36 coins, including silver and bronze coins, um, which essentially span the kind of late 16th to the late 17th century. So quite an interesting time span in thinking about the kind of events that are going on in this region at this time. So I think the earliest coin we have is a coin of Elizabeth I of England, which dates from around about 1572. So that's, that's our kind of earliest coin. We then have coins of James the, the sixth and first, Charles the first, Charles the second, and potentially there might be one example as well of a James the seventh uh, Irish gun money, so a 1690 coin potentially, but that's still to be decided by the numismatists. But certainly there's quite an interesting fan of coins going on here in terms of thinking about the makeup of the usual hoards that get found in Scottish context. It's quite a small hoard, 
in the grand scheme of the, the hordes that have been found from this kind of rough time period as well. But it clearly represents something slightly different from perhaps what your kind of classic hordes, which are, you know, the, the kind of bringing together of someone's material wealth represent, because there, there's some quite interesting kind of aspects to this assemblage, which you might be aware of. But the, the hoard itself was actually found in a pot underneath the slab of the hearth, which is quite interesting because it's clearly the kind of last activity that goes on in the occupation, at least, of this structure. Um, so what seems to have happened is we have a kind of cake of burnt material, of kind of ash and, and preserved hearth material, which is at the back of the hearth there, you can kind of see in the ready orange. Um, there's then what seems to have occurred is someone swept out the kind of hearth contents, um, perhaps in a slightly hurried fashion. They've lifted up the slab underneath the hearth. They've dug a sort of small circular depression. They've tapped the, the coin hoard in quite carefully with this really nice stone lid. And the stone lid seems to have been quite deliberately kind of, either the pot has been, neck has been kind of broken and reworked to use that stone as a lid, um, which suggests that it might be, have been that the vessel itself was a kind of pearly pot, so an early kind of purpose-built money pot, um, which is quite interesting. But certainly this has then been placed on top. Um, the, the slab has been placed back over the top of that, and then a fire has never been lit in this structure again, which is quite interesting in thinking about you're certainly not living here, you're not spending any time here if you're not having a fire on. And so there's quite a kind of sudden end to our occupation that seems to, to correspond with the laying of this coin board. And considering the latest coin that we have is uh, 1682, that is only 10 years before the Glencoe massacre. So a quite quite an interesting kind of suggestion that perhaps that that is one of the, the kind of impetus for the abandonment of this structure. And if we think about the kind of power of the McDonald's of Glencoe, it's quite, quite sharply waning at that point in terms of both the kind of resources that they can bring to bear, but also the land within Glencoe that they actually themselves then control. Because by the, the 1740s, 1720s, 1740s, the Stuarts of Appen actually own or run most of the farms um, on the, this side of Glencoe by this point. Certainly Achnacon and Inverigan have both been granted to the Stuarts of Appen, um, who are the kind of feudal, the direct feudal superiors of the, the, the McDonald's of Glencoe. So there's a clear kind of waning of power and perhaps a kind of abandonment, abandonment of this kind of upland entertaining space at that point. And interestingly, on top of the, the hearth slab, actually, we had the kind of closing deposit of two small spindle whorls were deposited um, into a kind of hand-shaped depression, I would say, um, which seems like quite an interesting kind of closing of this two really nice kind of lead decorated spindle whorls. So clearly, again, somebody's quite prized possessions. Um, but looking a little bit more at the composition of the, the hearth, the hoard, um, so it was taken back and excavated at, at the, the university. Um, and the students who'd been part of the field school got to be involved in that process, which was very nice. And it was a very exciting process, obviously. It's not every day you find a, a, a hoard of coins. Um, but looking at the actual the kind of composition of the hoard then, we have this really, really interesting kind of bringing together of connections, both local again and, and, and global. Um, so we have, we have a, a, a fair smattering of domestic coins, both kind of Scottish and English coins, um, and potentially Irish coins too, um, among the kind of silver coins. But then we also have a kind of curating almost of kind of selective pieces um, of of coins from kind of different time periods as well, or different time periods, but also different places across Europe as well. So this is kind of speaking to the connections of the McDonald's of Glencoe chiefs in this time period. That's quite interesting. Um, thinking about them not so much as kind of pinned to their kind of area. And already our kind of pottery assembly shows that they have these connections going all the way to the kind of Germany and the Rhine um, and, and quite across kind of wider Europe too. But the coins really speak to this. Um, so we have examples of coins of uh, Louis the Thirteenth, Louis the Fourteenth, um, in the in the form of the two kind of French coins there. Um, so there's the the kind of nice copper coin there, which again, thinking about kind of copper currency in Scotland from from kind of continental Europe, presumably this doesn't actually have any particular financial value. It's not really it's not going to be in circulation. It doesn't actually have a kind of commercial value, a financial value, in the context in which it was found. But clearly, someone's still preserving this, collecting this, and and kind of curating it within their kind of collection of coins here. Um, we also have then another kind of copper coin of Philip of Spain, um, and this one it seems to be from the Spanish Netherlands, um, and it's dated from, we reckon, uh, either 1616 or 1676 or 1636. It's still to be decided by the numismatists, because um, that's not my forte. Um, but certainly it's a, a, another kind of coin that's quite interesting, because again, it speaks to these kind of travels or connections or kind of trade, but it's not directly linked. To, to, to kind of commercial activity potentially, because it really, in the kind of context of Glencoe, presumably has very little financial value. Other examples of that are this coin at the very far end here, hopefully you can see, which is actually from the Papal States as well. So this is a quadrino of uh, one of the Clements popes um, of the, the early 1600s. Um, so again, another coin that seemingly has no real financial value or, or kind of monetary value in, in the context of Glencoe or kind of wider Scotland, but has been again kind of curated into this assemblage of coins um, which is 
is perhaps being used. There are some examples of, of, of French coins that are in kind of high status dwellings in the Western Highlands of Scotland, certainly, um, which are maybe being used as kind of gaming tokens again. So perhaps that's an aspect of what's going on here. This, this perhaps, you know, the, the, those coins that don't have a monetary in its symbol, just essentially um, are being used as kind of part of a kind of gaming set. Um, and it's perhaps part of kind of the McDonald's of Glencoe showcasing their tra their well-traveled nature or their connection through these kind of items. Um, but also some of the pieces as well maybe speak to kind of other processes going on as well. So we have quite a few of the coins are perforated. Um, so we have one of them, which is a Cromwellian Commonwealth coin, a Charles II, a Charles I, and potentially a James, all of which have kind of perforations in them. So the kind of keeping of coins as amulets and this kind of association with kind of images of the king or images of the cross, which in the cases these coins have kind of either or, as being kind of almost a, a, a kind of piece that you can kind of swear oaths on, um, but also that perhaps has kind of curative for, uh, or, or kind of good luck qualities as well. So there's something quite interesting going on there. Interestingly as well, quite a lot of the coins have either been bent or uh, snapped in half, which again, there's an aspect to which there's a, there's a kind of tradition that, that coins which had either the king's face again or the, the cross on them could be used to swear small oaths or to make kind of promises. Um, and so the act of snapping a coin in half half was actually perhaps uh, a part of that kind of oath making or an oath taking uh, process and that each person who kind of had a had a part in that oath would take a half of the coin and so that would be the kind of testament to that that the oath being made and um, there it might be that they were being halved obviously for for more practical reasons to kind of half their current their, their value essentially and and the kind of way of of kind of hack silver um but Certainly the fact that it appears in so many of the coins and some of them appear just to have been bent almost rather than broken entirely does suggest that there's something a bit different going on with them that's quite interesting. And so just to think about the kind of connections of this site then, so from, from a tiny or a fairly small and, and kind of relatively insignificant in the kind of wider scheme of things structure and the and a kind of side glen in Glencoe, we have these connections across kind of wider Europe. We have connections to Rome, to France, to the Low Countries, uh, to Spain, to Egypt. To Kind of the, the full spread of Germany, both north and southern Germany, but then we also have coins from Ireland, um, pottery from the east coast of England, um, and and from the the west coast of England too, um, and then also kind of the connections to the kind of colonial system as well, to tobacco being brought in from the Americas and such as well. So this is a really interesting and quite kind of well connected site. Thinking about the kind of relative status of the McDonald's of Glencoe, they're not that powerful, they're not that wealthy, um, and they're, and they're not that kind of well resourced either. So they're quite small players in the game, and yet they have this kind of huge wealth of connections across wider Europe um, and across wider Britain as well. So there's something really, really interesting, I think, that we can unpick from these different assemblages, which hopefully will paint as a, a really interesting picture, I think, of both the kind of role of the McDonald's of Glencoe within their wider society. What, what, why is it that they are having kind of access to all these resources when it does appear that other, other kind of high status buildings don't have the same sort of material coming on? So, you know, is this kind of bribes and, 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 and kind of diplomatic gifts being given, you know, Campbell of Bredalbin, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of give you all these nice and shiny things if you're willing to clear the McGregors off Rannoch for me. Um, or, or is it kind of other, other kind of processes during which this kind of longer period that we're looking at, that the McDonald's are kind of being bought to one side or the other um, with, with the kind of exchange of diplomatic gifts. So there's certainly some quite interesting connections we can draw out from this. Now, I'll, I'll just kind of wrap up there. Um, we're hoping... To, to kind of continue our work in Glencoe. So we're hoping to conduct further excavations of some of the settlement sites in Glencoe um, in partnership with the NTS to try and build a better picture of kind of how, how life changed in Glencoe, how life was prior to the massacre, what impact the massacre actually did have on kind of settlement patterns and the occupation of the Glen, um, and then also kind of how life continued after that and the kind of changes that brought about that were brought about kind of around about the time of the sheep farming and clearances and such as well. So we're hoping to do a, a kind of quite substantial pro, uh, program of excavations around the Glen. Um, and also trying to find some of those settlement sites that have now kind of been lost to time that we know were there, places like the Latantium, um, and 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 a few of the, and the kind of settlement of Karnak itself, which is kind of lost underneath the modern crossing settlement. Um, but also then to look at some of the other kind of aspects of the, the the kind of area as well. So thinking about the kind of foreshore archaeology, is there any kind of evidence for kelp kelp cones, fish traps, uh, boat nests, and kind of mooring places? I mean, certainly there's some interesting kind of place name evidence around there that might suggest that there, there is kind of foreshore markets and such going on, and um, but also the area around the this sort of 17th, uh, the 18th century mill as well, which appears in the rental records, and we have the structure for. We don't know that much about what's going on in the wider area, so that's another one of our kind of programs of further research. Um, I'd just like to, to make some acknowledgements. So, so thanks to um, the, the kind of my uh, supervisors and the people who've kind of contributed to the research program that we've done here, um, as well as to the the National Trust for Scotland's team and staff. Um, 
thanks as well to, to Duncan Foxley, Derek, uh, Derek Hall and Jesper Eriksson, who have kind of provided some quite stimulating discussions so far on the material from the site and from the, the kind of archaeology more widely of the site and some, some of the kind of sources we might want to dive into and um, that informed kind of where our, our thinking is going. Thanks to the, the team who helped out on the various field work that's going on in the area, including our amazing team of students this season. Um, and, and also to our research partners in the area, so the Glencoe Folk Museum, the National Trust for Scotland, Paolo Berladelli uh, of the Great Grand Ranch, uh, and also the land agents of Blackmount Estate and Black Quarries Estate as well, um, and our various funders um, as well. I'll just wrap up there then. So thanks 